um, Genesis chapter two and three. Um, I'm gonna start reading at verse four, and I think I'm just gonna do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read all the way through chapter three. It's kind of a long passage, but I, I think, you know, as we're learning about the Bible and reading through it, maybe, maybe there'll be something good about just reading this passage all out loud before we start to dig into it. So I'm gonna start in verse four of chapter two. I invite you to just take a Bible out, follow along, and then uh, keep your Bibles open as we proceed. And I'll just remind you again, this is God's word. We're anticipating hearing his voice. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden, there was a tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is a Pishon, winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there's gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic, resin, and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is a Jihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is a Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you'll surely die. The Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man." For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You'll crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you'll give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. 
To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat of it all the days of your life. It'll produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out of his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay, Uh, if you were here with us last week, we talked about Genesis chapter one, which describes the creation. And uh, one of the things we said about the creation is that this creation is just, I mean, it is so good, so majestic, so beautiful, and it puts on display the glory of who God is. Not only in, in the mere breath. I mean, it's, we think about the stars being stretched out, uh, out across the universe and the beauty of just looking up at night and seeing the, the entire universe. Or even when you, you look at the detail, uh, a tiny butterfly, uh, the creation is just good through and through and puts on display the God who, who thought it all up, who, who designed every piece of it in all its detail and, and all its beauty. And there's a refrain as God creates each day. He he makes an evaluation of this creation. And the refrain goes like this. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. And, And then at the very end of chapter one, as he looks over everything, when everything's finished, God makes this evaluation. It's very Good. And we talked about how we have this intuitive sense as we look at things. It's just like there, there is this breadth and, and majesty to everything there is, both, both in, in its vastness and in the tiniest details that just have the fingerprints of God all over it. And when we see it, we're just, wow, it's, it's awesome. It's beautiful. It speaks of God. Okay, but uh, we also have an intuitive sense of something else. That as good and beautiful as everything is, uh, we kind of look around, and no matter where we look, there's things about it that, that are broken. And we don't have to get very far. We can just think about ourselves, right? Like, our bodies are broken. I mean, how many of us walked in these doors today feeling sore in one place or another, or we're fighting off some sickness or disease? If we're not now, we know that we either have or will be. Our, our bodies are They're not the way they're supposed to be. They're they're broken. Our minds, our emotions are broken. I mean, so many of us probably walk through this door today and and we're struggling with anxieties and fears that are unfounded. We're struggling with depression. We're struggling with with our emotions, right? Our our minds are, are broken. Our relationships with one another are broken, right? I mean, hey, the we've been given an awesome world and one of the best things that there is in this world is relationships that we can share with one another. But, but why is it so difficult? Why is there so much misunderstanding and trouble and, and why do we run into all the problems? Like our relationships, not only with one another, but, but even with God are broken. And as you know, we move from the individual and society begins to collect itself, we see that the entire fabric of society is broken. Like the economy, right? Am I right? It's broken. Our systems of human government, do they work right? I mean, they're broken. I mean, even the weather, it's broken. And uh, what do we make of this? Like, what's the reason? What, what's going on? Chapters two and three begin to address this question that we just intuitively have. Like, how come things aren't the way they're supposed to be? How come things are, are broken? Let's start this way. I wanna just collect some data from uh, these chapters and just introduce some thoughts. One of the things as we begin to read through the Bible together that we're gonna discover, especially in the Old Testament, is that the names of the characters are really significant. They're not just kind of a conglomeration of, of, of letters and sounds, but often what we find is as we read various different stories and the characters are there, the names that the Bible gives them speak to the core of, of who they are. And that's especially true here. And, and so let's just, Let's just start to look at that together. 
I want to call your attention to chapter 2, verse 7, which says this, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now, uh, you may know this, that the Bible, the Old Testament, was originally written in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. And so sometimes in our English translation, there are things that were originally intended that we can't see anymore because we're reading a translation. I want to key you into some of those things. In verse 7, where it says, the Lord God formed the man. The Hebrew word for man is the word Adam. Adam. And by the way, this is where Adam gets his name because the Hebrew word for man is Adam. And what you wouldn't know unless I told you is this, that there's actually a play on words that happens here in verse seven. It says, the Lord God formed the Adam from the dust of the ground. And what you probably wouldn't know is that the word ground is the Hebrew word Adama. And uh, there's this play on words and this verse intends to show that there's a deep connection between the Adam and the Adama. God forms the Adam from the Adama. And so, core to who Adam is, is there's this relationship between him and the ground from which he's formed. In fact, one of the things that God does is he, he sends Adam into the garden to go work the ground. And so kind of core to his reality is that he's connected to this ground. And I would say in Genesis chapter two, there's this good, pleasing, corresponding, pleasant relationship between the man and his work of the ground. Okay, I want you to look now with me at the end of this chapter because you'll see that, that this becomes a theme in this particular chapter. Look at verse 23. Probably you even heard this as we read through, right? God at one point made an evaluation. He said it's not good for the man to be alone. So he decides he's gonna make a suitable helper. He um, brings all the animals and he begins to name them one by one, but none of them, none of them are cut from the same cloth. None of them kind of satisfy the way another human being can. And so God does this. He causes the man to fall into a deep sleep and, and he, he takes the rib from Adam's side and from that rib, right, she's cut from the same cloth. She's gonna get him. She's gonna understand him. He forms this woman and he wakes up from his sleep and he exclaims in verse 23 these words. He says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And he says, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And it actually, in the English, works here because we see the play on words between woman and man, but I wanna just key you into what the original Hebrew was. Um, by the way, Hebrew works a lot like English. Sometimes there's more than one word for the same concept. The general word for, for man is this word, ish. And uh, the word, that's the word that's used here, for she was taken out of ish. The Hebrew word for woman is this word, isha. She shall be called isha because she was taken out of ish. So just like there's this relationship between Adam and Adama, right? He's Adam because he's, he's taken from the Adama, the ground. So also this woman, she shall be called isha because she was taken out of ish. And so... There's something core to who she is. There is this relationship that she is made for between her and her husband. In fact, there's something so beautiful about this that the Bible then says for this reason, for this relationship, a man's gonna leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two are gonna be one flesh. And um, they just have this open, free relationship because verse 25 says the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame, which I think at the very least means this, like, they are totally open and exposed to one another and it's okay. There's nothing they need to hide, nothing they need to cover up. They're just, they're okay. There's this beautiful, pleasant, corresponding relationship between the two of them. Um, one more thing, uh, her name. You remember that Adam names her. Look with me at chapter three at verse 20. Uh, this is also significant. It says in verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Hebrew word here for Eve is the word cheva, and uh, it's an interesting word because it sounds exactly like the Hebrew word for living, cheva. And um, you, see the, you see the kind of parallel, right? She's going to be called cheva because she would be the mother of all the 
living. And so Kaur also, to who she is, not only this relationship, but her identity also has to do with the fact that she is going to be a mother. I mean, it's just, it's like that is who Eve is. She's going to be the mother of all the living. Okay, um, here's what I want you to do. Take that piece of data, store it here, turn the key, no one's going to take that away from you, and we're just going to move on. We'll come back to it, but for now, okay, that's done. All right, uh, let's go back to chapter two. Um, We see here that God intended for us human beings to live in his presence and have this open, beautiful, loving relationship, ongoing relationship between us and God. I mean, it was a paradise, right? God created this garden, it was a paradise. He walked in the garden with Adam and Eve and his intention would be that there would be this loving relationship between God and Adam and Eve. And just speaking about love, I think we gotta kinda talk about the very nature of love and what it was when God made us in his image that he gave to us that was so special, he gave us the ability to freely will to love him as well. I mean, love by its very nature, requires that it be freely given, right? I mean, if, if I force someone to love me, I mean, that's not true love. True love only occurs when someone willingly chooses to love me back. And so one of the key things that happens in chapter two is it becomes clear that God has given the ability to, to these creatures which bear his image to, to choose whether they're going to, to respond by loving back or respond by saying, no, I'm not gonna love you. They have the ability to choose whether to be obedient or whether to rebel. And um, there's just one simple test that God gives of this choice they have. It's not a difficult commandment that he has. In fact, it's just so easy. He doesn't command them, okay, to prove your love, you gotta cross oceans to prove your love, you gotta, you know, it's not all the things they have to do. It's just one simple thing they should not do. So there were all these trees that could eat from the fruit of every single one of these trees except for for one, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God says, you eat of it. I mean, the commandment is right there in verse 17. You must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So there's just this one test of their obedience, of their love, of of their will, of their their choice. Are they gonna gonna be with God or, or walk their own way? Well, okay, we read the story already. You know what happens, right? They rebel. They walk their own way. And um, when they do, uh, it becomes clear that there's, there's three things that come into human experience which had never been there before. And I want to take some time, just as far as getting some data out on the table, to talk about these three things which came into human experience which had not been there before. Let's start by looking at verse five. So um, there was this serpent that came to tempt Eve and uh, he asked, did God really say you can't eat of any of the fruit in the garden? She said, no, we can eat of all the trees in the garden, just this one, we we can't eat of it or we're gonna die. And he says, you're not gonna die. And then says this, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and I want you to catch these words, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, question, what was the temptation? I mean, I want you to remember that in chapter one, you remember these words? So God said, let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. So God created man in his own image, in his own likeness. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You see, of all the creatures, human beings were already most like God. God, like if you looked around, like which creature out there is like God? Like human beings, we are the ones that are like God. So what was the serpent saying? Like, hey, I've got something here. You can be like God when they already were like God. What was he, what was he saying? I think the best way to understand it is like this. You can, you can be like God in that you can make your own choices. You can be God. You don't have to have him telling you what to do. You can decide for yourself. You can go your own way. You don't listen to him. Do it for your own. See, that, that's what enticed them. And um, 
I mean, theologians have said this every time they talk about the nature of sin. They say at the heart of it, there, there's something called, and I'll just put the word up here on the screen, pride. Okay, at the heart of every sin, there is this pride. This pride that says, you know what? I'm doing it my way. I'm in charge. I don't need God telling me what to do, what not to do. I'll do it my way. And when they succumb to sin, for the very first time, it was never there before, there was in the human heart pride. Okay, there's a second thing that came into their experience, which was there for the very first time. I want you to look with me at verse 7. So Eve sees that the fruit is good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom. She takes some, she eats it, she gives some to her husband who's with her. He eats it. And then verse 7 says this, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Um, so apparently, as soon as they eat that fruit, their, one of their first realizations is, we're naked. Um, Bible trivia, this is the second time the word naked appears in the Bible. Do you remember the first? We just talked about it. It's the end of chapter 2, verse 25. Right? There's this relationship that God gives them that's beautiful and, and pleasant and corresponding. And, and it says, the man and his wife were both naked. And it says, they felt no, you see the word there? Shame. They felt no shame. I don't know about you, but I always get a kick reading this verse. I wonder to myself, what would that have been like to your entire life be naked but not know it? And then all of a sudden, you look down and you're like, <gasps> I mean, <laughs> I think the Bible has some humor in it as well as it tells a story. Like, what was that like? But I think it intends to communicate this, that for the very first time, they experienced shame. Um, this is what shame does. It makes us want to put a mask on, to pretend, to cover up. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Everything's good. I'm, I'm fine. When inside, we could be dying, but, but we got this mask on. I'm fine. Um, we want to hide. We want to cover up. We want to pretend. You know what a good picture of shame is? Uh, I'm sure you've seen it. You're watching TV, right? And someone's committed some heinous crime and all of us are tuned in and we want to see who this person is. And so they're bringing them out of the courtroom for the first time and there's all kinds of lights and cameras there and they walk out and what do they do? Right? You've seen that before. I mean, our impulse, because of shame, is to cover up, to pretend, to put a mask on. We don't want to be seen for who we are. And so uh, this is the second thing that comes into view, into our human experience as a result of sin. The third thing. Uh, look with me now at verse 8. It says that the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The third thing that came into their experience was this, guilt. Um, you ever have this where um, you owe somebody a debt and uh, you know they're coming so you leave or get out of the way, you, you avoid them? Like the debt collector, anyone would be willing to admit this? The debt, debt collector's calling on the phone and you know they're calling, so you don't answer because you don't want to, you avoid the situation, right? Adam and Eve knew they crossed a boundary. They knew that they now incurred a debt to a holy God. And so they do what guilty people do. They try to avoid the situation, and the Bible says they went to hide. And um, I want to talk about the cumulative effect of pride, shame, and guilt, Here's what pride does. It makes us say to ourselves, I'm fine. I don't need God. I've got this, right? This is what shame does. It makes us pretend, cover up. Everything's okay. I'm not hurting. I got, I, I'm okay. Well, no, no, nothing's wrong. I'm, I'm fine, right? We've got a mask on. And you know what guilt does? It makes us want to avoid the whole thing. God, no, no. no. God, no. And um, the cumulative effect of these three, pride, shame, and guilt, is that we as human beings would be absolutely content to be away from God. 
If we just stay in our pride, our guilt, and our shame, I- I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. Oh, no, no, not that. I don't want to talk about God. We would be content to just stay away from God. Pride, guilt, and shame. And I'll just, so we see the whole picture. I want you to look at the end of chapter three. Um, as we read through the Bible, we find out that God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. He can't just wrap his arms around our dirtiness, our guilt, and our shame. And so this is what we see as they fall into sin. God, because he is righteous and, and we can't be in his presence, it says here, so the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he'd been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. I guess these cherubim are like supernatural bouncers, right? Anybody here ever been bounced out of somewhere? Come on, somebody. Somebody want to, all right, thank you for admitting. You know what it's like, like, get out. That's what happened to us. We can no longer be in God's presence. We are bounced out. And as we hit the curb, we stand up and we say, I don't need God. Nothing's wrong, I'm fine. God, I don't want to talk about that. That's what, that's what happens, right? This is our cumulative experience. And, and here's the trouble. God is the source of life. And if we're cut off from him, then we're in trouble because he's the one that keeps us alive. And if we stay this way, we are going to die. Now, I want you to notice a few things in chapter three because this becomes a theme that you find running throughout the entire Bible. First of all, God is the one who takes the initiative to rectify the situation, to save these people, and to begin to pick up broken pieces. Look with me at verse nine. So Adam and Eve, they're hiding. They're avoiding God. They're trying to get away. God, it says, is walking in the cool of the garden, and it says, the Lord God called out to the man, where are you? Of course, God knows everything, so he knows where they are. But you see what's happening? This is a God who reveals that he has a heart to seek after what's been lost. Where are you? Look with me at verse 15. So God, he's going to speak some words to this serpent who who is the devil. And um, he, he curses the devil. And in verse 15, he says this, I am going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is the first announcement that there will come an offspring from this woman who at one point will defeat the powers of Satan and evil. This is the first announcement of this, the cross, that one of her offspring will crush the head of Satan and evil. And um, finally, I want you to look with me at verse 23 or excuse me, verse 21. Verse 21, it says of chapter three, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And uh, of course, you know, we notice here that God is gonna take the initiative to cover shame, but it might be even more important to notice, of course, what these garments are made of. They are garments of skin, which means at some point there was a what? An animal. That's now what? You would hope. (laughs) there is a dead animal there has been a substitute to die in our place which all points to here in other words God is going to take the initiative this is what chapter 3 begins to say God is going to take the initiative to pave the way through the cross so that we can reestablish a relationship with him does that make sense God is the one who who has a heart to seek what's lost. He is the one who promises to deal with Satan and evil. He is the one who is going to pave the way to the cross so that sin can finally be dealt with. Okay, and he's done that, but here we are, full of pride saying, well, I guess that's nice what Jesus did, but I don't need him. Or we're filled with shame and we're like, well, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm, you don't need to know anything about it. I'm fine. Or we just avoid the whole thing altogether. And I mean, there's probably many of us who, I mean, you're here today, 
But there were years that went by when you just didn't want to, church, God, what? I'm not, no, that's not, that's not for me. I'm not weak. I don't need that, right? All right, there's something else God did. And by the way, it'll be tough to make sense of your life unless you understand what it is that God's doing. And I, I want you to see this at the end of chapter three. Um, God does something. He, he speaks and he, I guess I'll put it this way. He adds some what I'll call frustrations into our lives. These are purposeful frustrations, difficulties. Uh, they're called curses here. And he does it for a reason. I want you to first of all look at what it was he said to Adam. We'll start in verse 17. It says, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and you ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. I want you to catch these words, they're so important. He said, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat of it all the days of your life. It'll produce thorns and thistles for you. And you'll eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you're going to eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you'll return. By the way, I call these frustrations um, that are enumerated here representative frustrations. They kind of represent the totality of all the difficulties, toils, frustrations, uh, griefs that we experience in this life. Here's, here's what happened. You remember... Adam was taken from the, the ground, right? The Adama. There was supposed to be this sweet, pleasant, corresponding relationship between the two. In the garden there was. But now God says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Cursed is the ground because of you. It's going to produce thorns and thistles. And when you work it, you're going to sweat across your brow. It's going to be difficult now. It once was easy, but now it's going to be difficult. And you're going to work all your life until your life is done. And the ground's going to swallow you back up because you're dust. And you're going back there. So yeah, at one point, it was, just, it was free. It was easy. It was open. It was pleasant. But now it's difficult, hard, painful. And um, guys, you know, right? Like, there's nothing easy about work. I mean, there are things we enjoy about it. It's still part of what God intended, but, but now it's full of difficulty. I mean, we just agonize, right? That's our experience. It's, it started here. Okay, uh, to the women. Uh, I want you to now look at verse 16 with me. What it was that God said to, to Eve, to the woman. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Okay, you remember, what is her name? Eve, because she's going to be a what? Mother, which is core to her identity. At the core of her identity, there's now pain. It's not easy. I mean, I know I've been through three. <laughs> Just kidding. My wife is here. <laughs> but, but that's the way it is right now, right? I mean, at the core of, of what it means to be a woman, now that it's not easy. It comes with trouble and difficulty. And uh, you remember, right, she's called woman because she was taken out of man. There's this relationship between the man and the woman that's supposed to be good and pleasing and pleasant. The end of verse 16 says this, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. What does that mean? Your desire will be for your husband. I think the easiest way to kind of interpret that, you, you got to see where the, that particular Hebrew word for desire occurs next. It actually occurs next in chapter 4 which is the story of Cain and Abel. You know that story, Cain and Abel? Cain and Abel are both offering sacrifices to God. One of their sacrifices is accepted Abel's, one is not Cain's. And uh, Cain gets all upset. He's angry, he hatches a plan, he's gonna kill his brother, and God shows up. And if you look with me at verse six of chapter four, God asks him a question. God says, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what's right, sin is crouching at your door. Now catch these words. It desires, that's that same word, to have you, but you must master it. What does that mean? Sin desires to have you, but you must master it. I think, I think what it means is this. Sin wants to master you, but Cain, you need to rule over it. Now look back with me at chapter 3, verse 16. God says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. I think the best way to understand it is this. You are going to try to rule over your husband and he is going to try to rule over you. 
which at least for me explains a lot about marriage. <laughs> I mean, is there anyone else who's been in these fights about, well, that's not the way we did it when I was kids? I mean, right, there's this struggle that goes on. At, at the beginning, it wasn't supposed to be like that. It was good, it was pleasant, it was easy. There was no trouble in it. But now look, it's not easy. There's frustration, there's difficulty, it's hard. And I think, by the way, these, these frustrations are, are representative. All the troubles we face in this life are kind of put in this category. God was not content to just kind of let us be how it was. So, so he added frustrations. And so I want you to see this. God, if you will, he, he, he paved a road to us through the cross of Jesus so that our sins could be forgiven, so that he could reestablish a relationship with us. He did that. He took the initiative. He went to seek the lost. But here we are over here. And although God's done that, we're like, I don't need God. I'm fine. There's no problem. I, I got this mask on. I'm like, everything's cool. I'm fine. And we've got this guilt thing where we'd like to just avoid the whole topic altogether. But God does something. He, he's not content to let us just wither away on our own apart from God. And so although we profess to be fine and we've got this, you know what God does? He overwhelms us. And he introduces circumstances into our life that literally bring us to our knees. And when we're on our knees, we call out and say, God, help. Only to see that, that he has helped and he sent his son Jesus to, to reestablish that relationship and, and pick up the broken pieces of our life and begin to put it back together. You see that? God, he, 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 he wants us to be overwhelmed so that we'll get down on our knees and say, help. I'm gonna make an observation. Um, this is my observation of humanity. Some of us have higher pain tolerances than others. Here's what I mean by that. Some of us, we get hit with the smallest thing. We're like, oh, that hurt God, please. Oh, Jesus, right? And, and it's like, it's so natural. Thank you, God, for the help. And it didn't take much. But there's some of us and some of us who are sitting here today who aren't like that. We get hit with a circumstance of life. Oh, I'm fine. Oh, that hurt. I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. And we just keep getting beat up, beat up, beat up. God's trying to talk to you. You cannot live apart from him. He's the source of life. And so... Life here is it's not easy. Why? Because God wants us to see that we cannot make it in this life without him. And at some point, he works through the circumstances of our life so that we turn, we open our eyes up, and we see this way that's, pay, this way that's paved through Jesus and the help that's there. That there's a God who takes the initiative to seek after what's lost. There's a God who takes the initiative to pick up the broken pieces of our life and begin to put them back together. And that is the God we serve. This is the story that we're about to read together of this loving God. And I'd like to just say this. If you're a person and, and, and you're being beat up by life, why not just surrender now? Why not let today be the day? Say, okay, God, I got it enough. Help. There's a God who loves you, who wants to bring you back to him, and he just calls us to surrender and trust in him and put our faith in him because he's done it all through Jesus.